What a great problem to have. You don't care about the message. You just want to hang out with other brothers and sisters in Christ. I see how it is. Hey, um, I want to read uh, our scripture for this morning, and it comes from the book of Acts, chapter 20, uh, verses 16 through 24. Paul had decided to sail past Ephesus to avoid spending time in the province of Asia, for he was in a hurry to reach Jerusalem, if possible, by the day of Pentecost. From Miletus, Paul sent to Ephesus for the elders of the church. When they arrived, he said to them, You know how I lived the whole time I was with you. From the first day I came into the province of Asia, I served the Lord with great humility and with tears. And in the midst of severe testing by the plots of my Jewish opponents, you know that I have not hesitated to preach anything that would be helpful to you, but have taught you publicly and from house to house. I have declared to both Jews and Greeks that they must turn to God in repentance and have faith in our Lord Jesus. And now, compelled by the Spirit, I am going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. I only know that in every city the Holy Spirit warns me that that prison and hardships are facing me. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. going to it's going to be an interesting scripture when we get into the, this this morning but before we jump into that I just want to introduce myself my name is Steve Sherrill and I'm the pastor here and I'm glad that all of you guys are with us today we're um, in week three this morning of this series that we're doing called divine direction and we've been talking for the last couple weeks about seeking God's direction when we're making decisions we've talked about these big life decisions and how do we know as Christians, what decisions we're supposed to make. How do we get this direction from God? And so in week one, I talked about how before we worry about the what, right, the the what does God want me to do, we have to first be concerned and focus on the who, right? Who is God wanting me to become, right? Who does God want me to become? See, because when we focus on the who, who we are, then God will lead us to the what. What are we supposed to do in whatever life decision we're thinking about? Now, we also discussed in week one the importance of, of our motives, right? We, we talked about how we first need to consider the, the why to our decisions. Before thinking about what God wants us to do, we have to think about the why, right? Why is God going to, to do this? Why is it that I'm thinking about this? Right? God will lead us to the right do when we, think, when, we, when we work on becoming the right who and when we focus on the why. What are our motives? Now, last week was all about wisdom. And we talked about how there are times that the Bible is clear about you should do this or you shouldn't do this. When the Bible's clear, our job is just to obey. But we also talked about how, how there's, there's not always going to be an exact answer given to you by God, right? He's not just going to always, in every single situation where you're looking for direction, just shout down in this voice, this, this God voice, and say, Steve, this is what I want you to do, right? So we don't always get exact answers to our questions, but we learn that, that he's always going to give us wisdom to decide. And our job in order to get this wisdom was to walk with the wise, ask God for wisdom, and decide. We talked about that last one, decide, because sometimes not making a decision can actually be the worst decision that we can make. Now, this inability to decide, this this thing that, that, that a lot of us struggle with in different parts of our lives, this, man, I don't know what I'm supposed to do, I don't know what God wants me to do, um, I think it's it's becoming... A, a bigger and bigger epidemic in our culture today. I, I, and I think the reason is that there's some, some specific changes that have happened in our culture over the last you know, two or three decades that are contributing to our inability to make decisions. Now, one of the reasons is that I think there's just so many more options today. You know, when we have a lot of things, if we've got 15 different outcomes, 15 different decisions we can make in this one area, it's a lot harder than if we just had two, right? If you have two, you just kind of go, eh, eh, okay, I'm doing this one. When there's 15, it's a lot harder. An example, 
right now, when, like when I went to, I just, a couple of weeks ago was my, my 25th high school reunion. I didn't go back to Columbus for it, but I saw these pictures of friends. They were doing this reunion stuff. And I'm like, man, 25 years. But 25 years ago, when I was going off to college, like everybody that I was around said, like, what college are you going to? And every question was like, what four-year college are you going to? Nobody was like, what are you doing? What are your plans? Are you going to go to work? Whatever. Nowadays, when I think about it, though, there's so many options. People can go straight from high school to four-year colleges. They can go to two-year colleges. Now college is quite a bit different, and you can just like finish your entire degree online, right? So you go to college online. The gap year, if you guys know what that is, gap years have become really big. I wish that I would have taken a gap year. I didn't even know what they were, but like people are going away for a year before they start school and doing missions, like a gap year. You can go to a trade school or vocational school. You can join the military. You can go straight to work, especially with the invention of technology stuff. Like some people are like, I don't need college. I'm just going to do this thing, website stuff, and I'm going to make money, and, and it works, right? Some people just start their own business right out of school. Now, another reason that it's hard to make decisions, first, is that there's just so many options today. But another reason is because this is a generation that has glimpses into people's lives through social media. And, and others' lives on social media oftentimes look perfect, while ours is anything but perfect. And so we want this perfect life that, that all these other people seem to have that we see online, and, and we're afraid to make an imperfect decision. And so often we get, we get paralyzed with this indecision. I think another cultural shift that we're looking at is, is that we're over-programming children today. Like, when, when, when most of us in this room were kids, our parents would say, go outside and play, right? Um, what did you have to do, right? We would go outside and we would spend the entire day and we had to decide all day, over and over, tons of decisions. What are we going to do? How are we going to spend our time? What game are we going to play? Where are we going to go? Whose house are we going to go to? Whose yard? Are we, like, there's decisions all day long. Today, we tell our children what to do. We don't give them much room to decide, right? We say, hey, you're going to soccer on Monday and Wednesday. Your game's on Saturday. You've got piano on Tuesday. You've got tutoring on Thursday. You have church on Wednesday. You've got, like, all these other things going on. Kids today are involved in so many organized activities that we've, we've over-programmed them, and they haven't really developed a decision-making muscle. And so we have a lot of people who really battle with indecisiveness. We've also created a generation that, that struggles with FOMO. Everybody know what FOMO is? The acronym F-O-M-O, -O, the fear of missing out, right? There's a generation that have the fear of missing out. Now, people think it's kind of, kind of funny when we give it some goofy acronym called FOMO, but it's a real fear. People really struggle with this thought. You know, they're thinking, you know, I, I want the very best for my life, and so, so if I if I take this opportunity, then I have to say no to this opportunity and this opportunity and this opportunity. And so my fear of, of missing out on that thing over there is going to keep me from committing over here. But the problem here is that an uncommitted life is always an unsuccessful life. And this is how the fear or, or this problem of indecisiveness is actually impacting so many people in the world today. And so what I want to talk about today is trusting God's process. Trusting God's process. In Acts chapter 20 that we read, Paul, he's talking about a, a pretty emotional decision that he had to make. See, Paul loved where he was in the city of Ephesus. Those people were his people, and this was, was his place. He felt at home there. Now, he could have spent the rest of his life doing what he was doing in Ephesus. He was, he was really happy there. Then he felt prompted. He felt prompted by God to leave and to go somewhere else. And so, so he calls all of the elders together, the elders of the church, and he explains to them, he says, God is moving on me. And he had this emotional farewell with the elders that he called together. And this is what happened in Acts chapter 20. Uh, this was the last part that I read, 22 through 24. Paul says, and now, compelled by the Spirit... I'm going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. I only know that in every city the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. 
Now, in this passage, we see four steps in God's process, and we're talking about trusting God's process today. And so what I want to do is show you these four steps in this process, and I think it's something that we're going to see over and over again in our own lives, right? As, as, as a Jesus follower, we're confronted with decisions, and so what is this process we can go through to trust God? The first one, if you're, if you're a fill-in-the-blank kind of person, is, is what we're going to call the Spirit's prompting. Spirit's prompting. Acts 20, verse 22 says this, And now, compelled by the Spirit, I'm going to Jerusalem. Paul's saying, look, I, I love it where I am, but God is calling me somewhere else. Compelled by the Spirit, I'm going to to Jerusalem. Now, the, the Greek words here, the phrase that, that is translated compelled by the Spirit, the, are the words deo homo, I'm sorry, I say that wrong, deo honuma. Deo honuma are the, is this phrase, uh, compelled by the Spirit. So deo means wrap. It's, it's kind of like wrapping with, with a cord that's pulling you in a direction. And pneuma is spirit or breeze or, or current. And so deo honuma is really a phrase that's talking about there's this cord that's kind of wrapped around you. It's, it's pulling you, and it's bound by the, the breeze of the Spirit. So Paul's basically saying, look, I love where I am, but, but I'm experiencing something that's, that's pulling me in another direction. That's deo honuma. You know, he's saying, I, I wasn't seeking this out, but I'm compelled by the Spirit. Now, I want to tell you that if you are a Jesus follower. If you are a Christian, you need to look and you need to watch out for these Deo Honuma moments in your life. It could be something huge that's, that, where the Spirit just completely redirects your life. It could be something seemingly insignificant, but it's going to have a really big impact. You know, for me and, and my wife, that's, that's why we did foster care. That's why we entered the world of, of church planting. It's, it's why my family and I ended up here with you. See, in those situations, we first knew that God was, God was moving, and we felt the prompting of his spirit, and then we couldn't ignore it any longer. See, for some of you, God's been talking to you for a long time, and, and now you're compelled by the spirit to, to use your gifts to make a difference. That's, that's Deo Honuma. To start a business one day, that's Deo Honuma. To start a business one day, to, to write a book, who knows what it is, but if, if you feel like there's that pull, like something is just pulling me, the Spirit is moving me in a different direction. Paul says this, he says, now compelled by the Spirit, I'm going to Jerusalem. So we need to trust God's process. The first thought in, in trusting God's process, the first step is, is understanding the Spirit's prompting. Now, the second is certain uncertainty. We're going to call it certain uncertainty. Paul says this in verse 22, and now, compelled by the Spirit, I am going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. So he's saying, I'm called to go, but I don't know any details. I don't know anything at all. See, so often when we are seeking direction, we also seek the details, right? God, show me the details. Any of you guys remember the, I was going to say the, the recent movie, uh, the old movie now, A Few Good Men, right? Anybody seen the movie A Few Good Men? So, so Jack Nicholson is in A Few Good Men. He's on the witness stand, and Tom Cruise is the lawyer, and Tom Cruise is, is, is prosecuting Jack Nicholson's character. And so, so he's on the stand, and, and, and Jack Nicholson, his character on the stand, he says to Tom Cruise, he says, you want the truth? And Tom Cruise, who's, who's the lawyer, he says, I want the truth. And Jack Nicholson responds, you can't handle the truth. I think sometimes we say to God, I, I want the details. And God says, you want the details. No, he doesn't say it that way. Sorry. <laughs> he says it much more lovingly, right? He says, you want the details? Well, you can't handle the details. See, if Katie and I, if my wife Katie and I had known all of the details that came along with us entering the world of foster care as the way that we were going to, to grow our family, we probably wouldn't have gone that route when we were trying to adopt. See, nothing is assured to you 
when you have a foster child in your home. We had two other foster children other than our son, Evan, who both went back to their families. But this was God's plan for us, and so we trusted his process without knowing all of the details. If my wife and I had had all the details related to church planting, we definitely would not have gone down that road. If we would have known the time and the energy and the money that we would have personally invested only to close the doors of the church two years after we launched. But God had so much to teach us during that season of our life. So so he didn't show us all the details because we wouldn't have done it. And then he wouldn't have taught us the things that we needed to be taught. I love what Psalm 119, 105 says. Your word is a lamp to guide my feet. It's a light for my path. So what is God's word according to scripture? It's a lamp to guide our feet. It's not a spotlight in our future. It's just a light to our path. See, we say, show me all of the details. And God says, all I'm going to do is show you the next step. It's what certain uncertainty is. But I want certainty, you say. Well, if you want certainty, let me give you some certainty. God will never leave you, and God will never forsake you, and God will guide you step by step. Remember what we talked about last week, that God will advise you, and God will guide you, and God will watch over you. See, if you're not living with a little uncertainty in your life, if you're not living with a little uncertainty every now and then, then you're not living by faith. And if you're not living by faith, you cannot please God. We're called to live a life of faith, and certainty in every aspect of our life doesn't require any faith. Now, the third part of of God's process that we're learning to trust is what I'm going to call predictable resistance. Predictable resistance. Mark it down. Write a note to yourself. Scribble it on your hand. Predictable resistance. See, the, the, the enemy will resist what God leads you to do. It's a guarantee. This is what Paul says. All I know is I'm being prompted. I don't know what's going to happen there. He, I don't know what's going to go on when I go. In verse 23, he says, I only know that in every city the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. When do you think your enemy attacks? Is it when you're doing nothing for the glory of God? No, why why would he waste his time, right? He attacks when we are doing something for God's glory. He attacks when we are living by faith, when we're surrendering to him. See, resistance is not necessarily a sign that you're out of God's will. Resistance is often a sign that you're doing exactly what it is that God's calling you to do. So we have spiritual prompting, certain uncertainty, and predictable resistance, It's not always going to be easy. Now, before we look at this this fourth stage of of learning how to trust God's uh, process, I want to talk a little bit more about the life of the Apostle Paul. Because, see, in the early days, before Paul was a follower of Jesus, we have to remember who Paul was. He was probably one of the most dangerous persecutors of the followers of Jesus of his day. This guy killed Christians. He hated everything about Christians. And then Paul meets Christ, and he has this powerful conversion. And in a moment, his life is completely transformed. But, but don't think that that means that he immediately got to do everything that he wanted to do or that he was passionate about. Right after he became a Jesus follower, Paul, he spent three quiet years in obscurity in Asia, most likely studying. Then, as three years go by, we know then that he preaches in the city of Damascus. And his first sermon was so good that they try to kill him. How's that for a a great start to your new ministry? No one's tried to kill me yet. Maybe that tells me something about my preaching. But So so they're trying to kill him after his first message. and, And Paul, he runs for his life. He's struggling to pay the bills. Some more time goes by. He he wants to preach, but what is he doing? He's making 
tents. That's why Paul is called the tent maker, if you've ever heard that term. He's making tents. Some of you right now in your world, you're making tents. I have a friend of mine that's a chiropractor. He's a good chiropractor. He's got a great practice, but that's just making tents to him. He's called into to, to international missions, and, and the timing's just not quite right yet. His kids are r- different ages, and he's like, man, I'm, this is just my tent making until I go into international missions, right? You want to do something in life, but you feel like you're just making tents. Well, for Paul, about eight years or so goes by before things really begin to change. Barnabas vouches for him, which gives him some instant credibility. And after years of studying and waiting and praying and trying to preach, making tents and making some more tents, Paul's ministry starts. We have to trust God's process. See, God's doing something in you because he wants to do something through you. Don't miss that. When when you feel like God's kind of messing with you, we're talking about that, that tugging of the spirit. So when God's doing something in you, it's because he wants to do something through you. Trust the process. See, we've got to get the the right who before the right do shows up. You have to become who God wants you to be so that you can do what it is that God wants you to do. And so we have the, the spirits prompting, and we have certain uncertainty, and we have predictable resistance. And then number four, this fourth step to trusting his process is uncommon confidence. Uncommon confidence. If we look at verse 24 from Acts 20, Paul says, this is right after he talks about all I know is that there's going to be prison and hardships awaiting me. And then he says, however, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. So going forward from here, what did the apostle Paul do? Well, he, he wrote the, the largest portion of the New Testament that we have today. God's inspired word that changes lives. He started churches all across Asia Minor and Europe. And how did he do this? How did Paul make such an eternal impact? How did he make such a difference? Don't miss this. Paul did not have a plan for the future. He had a plan to obey this God's spirit today. He didn't know all the details of the future. His plan was, I'm just going to obey God today. You know, he's thinking, it's not going to be easy, but I'm certain that God wants me to serve Jesus wherever I am. And so for Paul, if he was preaching to a big crowd, then he's going to serve Jesus. He's going to talk to that crowd about Jesus. If, If Paul's locked up in prison, which he was, he's going to write about Jesus If Paul's locked up to a prison guard, because he was actually chained to a guard in a prison, then he's going to lead that guard to Jesus. If they're beating Paul and leaving him for dead, Paul is calling out to Jesus. Why? Because Paul is saying, I'm absolutely and completely confident that it's not about me and my career, but I have this heavenly calling to glorify Jesus wherever I am. So how does this apply to you? Where are, where are we supposed to, to be what, when we think, oh, okay, well, you got this great story about, about Paul, but what am I supposed to do? Where am I supposed to go? What am I suppo- what's my calling? Well, if you're making tents, then serve Jesus there. If you're waiting tables, serve Jesus there. If you're a, a stay-at-home mom, serve Jesus there. If you're a student, serve Jesus there. If you're working any kind of a job, serve Jesus there. If you're a retiree, serve Jesus there. See, the hard part is understanding that it's never about you, but it's all about Jesus. Remember, Paul said, however, I consider my life worth nothing to me. So wherever you are, whatever you do, do it for the glory of Jesus. When you get to that point, what happens? See, when you get to that point, you don't have to worry so much about the future. You just have to be obedient today. And when you're obedient today, you're not worried about missing out on something because you're doing exactly what God wants you to do, trusting that he will lead to the right do. Right? We, we can just, today is all I can 
worry about. Today is all I'm going to focus on. Now I don't need to worry about, well, what if I do this and miss out on that? Because today is what matters. The obedience of today, trusting that God's going to lead you to where he wants you. And so that's how we discern this divine direction. Step by step, we make our plans, but the Lord determines our steps. I hope that you guys will join us next week as we wrap up this series on God's divine direction in our lives. Let's pray.